was misdiagnosed and mistreated medically for 33 years. I was praying to God, deliver me from all this pain, the loss of energy, this ringing in my ears, um, this chronic arthritis, everything I was suffering from at that time. My realization that it was EMF that was causing the problem, I was on my knees, man. <laughs> Welcome back to Decentralized Radio, your one-stop shop for education on how you can take back control of your health and your wealth and live outside of the centralized systems that are plaguing our society. We're hosting industry experts every Tuesday live and also releasing podcasts Friday morning. All right, hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today we are joined live by Keith Cutter. Keith is the founder owner of EMF Remedy. He's an EMF mitigation expert and has an incredible story of how he used or realized that that EMFs were a big factor into why his health was um, not optimal. So Keith, how are you doing today? Thanks for joining. Hey, I'm doing great. I'm really happy to be on your show. So looking forward to this. Yeah, it's always fun for me when I can geek out, um, nerd out with someone about EMFs. Um, and we've talked a few times now. And it's really fun because for me, this is a huge gap in the health space, you know, the alternative health space, holistic health space overall. Still, EMFs is such a minor part of the conversation, mostly because I think it's a it's a giant uh, inconvenient truth. And just connecting with folks like yourself has, you know, it's incredible because you have your own network. There's there's a handful of really good EMF mitigation experts, and there's incredible stories to be told. So. Why don't we start there? Um, you've told me a bit about your story, but it, it's uh, an inspiring one and really shed some light on how people can think about EMFs in, in the way that it's affecting their biology. So what was the, the first straw in how you kind of got into this? And when you first started thinking about electromagnetic fields and their effect on our biology and our health? When I when I first started thinking about it was actually 33 years after I experienced the first symptoms. So I was misdiagnosed and mistreated medically for 33 years, and uh, it it just became increasingly unbearable. So w my realization that it was EMF that was causing the problem, I was on my knees, man. <laughs> I was praying to God. I had been praying, you know, please deliver me from all this pain, the loss of energy, this ringing in my ears, um, this chronic arthritis, everything I was suffering from at that time. And you know what? That prayer wasn't answered, but I, I decided one day, what if I changed my prayer to, God, could you just show me? Could you just show me what this is? And not saying that he spoke to me audibly, whatever, but you know, I am a believer and, and, uh, he's a big part of my life. So, um, yeah, within days I was led to this area that honestly I would have laughed at when I was younger. I would have, I would have mocked people probably who, who asserted that there was a link between, uh, non-native EMF exposure and health conditions, but this time I couldn't ignore it. <laughs> and so um, what I did is I did a remediation on my home and instantly things started to unravel, unwind. I mean, the bad things happening, uh, had happened over the past three decades began to unwind. The first and most dramatic was this crippling chronic arthritis I was suffering. It didn't get better. It went away entirely. <laughs> And to make a long story short, my physician, having seen this and himself becoming a, being a skeptic, he asked me one question when he saw this, because he had been my doctor for 15 years. And he looked at this sudden reversal, and uh, he said, he said, hey, can you come over to my house and check it out from an EMF perspective? So that was when I first found out. That's pretty incredible. I mean, when I was reading your story, I see so many parallels with with people that I've met in the space and just um, through my own experience as well, 
being more cognizant of my environment, I was just in Vegas and I could definitely feel the difference. Like I could feel like the hydration, not only from the humidity difference, but I'm in the desert. So it's pretty relative anyways, but I could feel like the dryness like creeping in. And I noticed this flying to Los Angeles back and forth for years, but never really connected any of these dots to the density of electromagnetic frequencies. So maybe we could speak to that a little bit about how we've sort of created uh, just briefly our own prisons within the place that probably should be the safest for us. And that is our homes uh, un unknowingly to ourselves. Yeah. Isn't that an interesting concept? And you know, the way this, um, the reckless spread of non-native EMF has occurred it was slow, right? There wasn't like cell phone service everywhere all at once. Um, it just happened a little bit over time, but now, man, we're in this saturation phase, right? So we imagine, most of us, I think, that we're not affected. But is that just because we look at the person to our left and the person to our right, and they're saying they can't sleep either, or they're saying they're anxious too, or, you know, whatever the symptoms are. So... It's an interesting hypothesis that there are some people that are not affected, but we can't prove that anymore. You know, we don't have a control. And the reason is if you have a cell phone signal in your home, you are living in an unnatural sea. And I think that's the best word, like an ocean, an unnatural ocean of electromagnetic energies. And the sensitivity, Ryan, that you talked about, that is so interesting. People ask, are you sensitive? Are you not sensitive? And they think it's a quirky thing. Wow, how weird some people would be sensitive to electromagnetic energies. Well, actually, there's a really complex electromagnetic environment on Earth. <laughs> it came with one. And the overwrite that we're doing with the man-made EMF is the only thing that, you know, that troubles people. So anyway, with that as a, uh, as an introduction, what I do, what I, the way I help my clients is we go into a client's home and we discover what quantities of which of the four major types of non-native EMF are present in the areas where they spend the most time in their homes. And then we document that and we determine roughly where those sources are coming from so that we can produce a custom remediation plan. The, um, the objective of that being that when we're finished with our work, not only that day, but whatever remediation efforts follow, that they will be able to enjoy more of the natural EMF and much less of the man-made EMF. That's kind of at a top level what I do. I, I'm involved in home design for EMF residences and pre-sales, uh, evaluation of land and things like that. But the core of what I do day, day in and day out is the home assessment and then remediation. Yeah, that that's a powerful thing because you mentioned a lot of key points there. It's like, where are we spending the most amount of time you know, the different types. And I want to get into that. But the way I think about EMFs is like, you know, they are unavoidable. Um, but we can have, you know, 90 95% reduction in just how we use technology or by making small adjustments. So, so that's the main point here, folks is like, you know, you don't have to live like Keith and I do and hardwire your internet and do all of these extra things you can, we'd almost recommend it but you don't have to do that to get a substantial reduction. So Keith, maybe you could go into those four types of EMFs that you mentioned, and then also the importance after uh, the importance of the earth's natural magnetic or electromagnetic fields, because it's important. And Keith has used the nomenclature non-native. I don't really like that nomenclature because it confuses people. I use it. I like it. I use it, but it can confuse people. So let's set the scene for them, the difference as well between native and, and non-native um, EMF. Yeah. 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 You bet. 
And I want to echo what you said there initially, Tristan, and that is that however far you want to go along this spectrum, you want to live in a totally shielded home, hey, that's great. You want to, you know, enjoy your life as it is and all the technology you're exposing yourself to, hey, that's great. You know, you just tell me which one you want and then we can optimize within that. And there are many simple things that can that can happen. So the the earth has a an electromagnetic field and it is it is complex and and it is beautiful when you understand all the parts that work together. I think this is really well documented in a book called The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg. And it begins with sunlight energizing the ionosphere. And you have bolts of lightning, which we're familiar with, that rain down on the surface of the earth, providing a negative charge, an excess of electrons relative to the uh, ionosphere. So a negative charge on the surface of the earth. And then those that charge uh, floats sort of through the air back up to the sky, meaning that we are living in this enormous. I mean, it is a huge electric field. It's about 130 volts per meter. And I'll tell you what, if you had 130 volts per meter of the harmful man-made kind of radiation, you really wouldn't be happy. But this natural energy of the earth, 130 volts per meter, that's what we're made for. And the, um, 130 volts per meter can vary. So in a thunderstorm or whatnot, it may be a million of volts per meter. And then we also have a magnetic field. And we don't really give it a lot of thought, except that our compasses work, right? You've got a compass, you're anywhere on the earth, you look at this thing, it swings around a little bit, and then then it settles down and it tells you where the magnetic north is. That's because we're living in a huge magnetic field. And then there is also a variable magnetic field, not an alternating magnetic field, but a magnetic field that kind of rises and falls. And it's actually a function of what I first talked about, which is those lightning strikes because they happen reliably enough and consistently enough around the world um, that they're giving that charge to the surface of the earth, there is a frequency of the rise and fall of a more subtle magnetic field coming from the earth, not the one for the compass. And that was first um, posited by a man named Schumann. And so that resonance and the... Um, multiples of that resonance are known as the Schumann resonances. And so the, the fascinating thing, the really cool thing about it is the Schumann resonance is around 7.83 hertz or cycles per second. And then you look at the human brain, and that's the native um, brain wave for the alpha rhythm. So I love it when God makes things <laughs> obvious for me. All mammals as well have that same signature within their brain. So it's pretty easy to see this place is made for us. We're made for this place. And of course, I also, you know, as I talk about the surface of the earth, having this excess of electrons, that's what grounding, that's what earthing is all about. You know, putting your feet on the ground and having, having um, physical access to those electrons. And we can get into that later on. But now the really important part in understanding all of what I've just said is there is an electricity of life. Okay. And there is the man's implementation of electricity. The electricity of life is much closer to what we see in a battery where the positive and the negative are, are always the same. The surface of the earth is always negatively charged and the heavens or the ionosphere is always positively charged. We're meant to dwell in that space and the magnetic field is a 
direct current magnetic field, all right? And then the man-made energies are alternating current, which means if you can imagine this, you're sitting in this void between heaven and earth and your, your whole biology is made to exist where the negative charges on the bottom, the positive charges on the top, with man's energy that flips. One instant it's up is up, and the next instant up is down. Literally positive for negative, positive for negative. And it happens in North America 60 times per second. So it is, um, it is unknown in nature and it is completely foreign to life. And just the spread of the electric grid across the world brought with it all the disease of civilization. It is an amazing story. So, yeah, does that is that what you were asking about, Tristan? Or that was an amazing overview. I think very digestible for people. Really well said. It it's hard because I mean you've studied this obviously quite extensively. I have an electrical engineering background. Ryan's really passionate about this stuff, and he's listened to me talk for a while um, about it too. Um, but a lot of these terms are are foreign to people or they've heard of them, but they don't really understand. Like a lot of people know that our circuits are 120 volts, 60 Hertz, but they don't really understand what that means and, and those implications and, and why that may be different from, you know, electromagnetism in nature. So it's, it's really important. You touch upon grounding for me, everything you just said encapsulates two things. It encapsulates the fact that nature, the earth, and our human biology is electromagnetic by, you know, at the lowest level. And this is an important takeaway because most people are more familiar with biochemistry than they are with electromagnetism. And that's one of the main issues I see with the, you know, centralized medical healthcare system, education system. And then second is that within those uh, electromagnetic worlds, um, everything we do, we think and we look to nature and, and the electromagnetism in nature that you just so eloquently outlined is, is far different from the electromagnetism coming from man-made sources. So, you know, you mentioned there at the end, the invention the rollout of of modern electricity has kind of led to a lot of chronic disease so maybe I, i'll just ask is how do we you know correlate you know people i'm just going to play devil's advocate people are very skeptical of these things even our audience are still skeptical that you know the electrical power in their house is really setting them up for failure from a health perspective if they're not dealing with it correctly. So how do people wrap their head around the fact that this may be one of the underlying, you know, issues or toxins, as I like to say, in our environment? How is that affecting our biology? Why haven't we all, you know, keeled over like chronic disease? really has been proliferating much faster in the past, you know, 30 years compared to the previous 70 that the grid was available. How do you convince the layman or even the moderately informed person who's caught or, you know, cognizant of their health and toxins that this is really a, a baseline issue that should be dealt with? Well, my, my answer might be a surprise. Um, so how do I convince people? When I first um, started doing what I'm doing now, I reached out to, to some of the leaders in EMF assessment and remediation because I found long ago in it, when I was in industry, I need to talk to the people who really know what's what and get the great advice. And um, one of my best mentors gave me a great piece of advice. He said, don't don't spend any time at all with people who don't get it. Said, you know, that the, the time is short, man. Spend all of your efforts on the people who get it. And so, believe it or not, I, I do that. 
um, day in and day out. I just don't spend any time trying to convert people except when I do. <laughs> and what I mean, what I mean by that is, you know, I go into the ice cream store and I see a young lady working there who my children grew up with, with her and, and I know her parents well and whatnot. She's got a cell phone in her back pocket. And then in that moment, I just can't help it. And I say, by the way, <laughs> you know, I'll, you know, I'll just, I'll just share something, but it's, it's just because I can't help myself. But what I've found is people are either ready to learn something or they're not ready to learn something. And if somebody's not ready to learn something, there it it isn't going to take root in them. That's um that's what I think that I've learned. Now, for somebody who is interested or open to the fact and and it may have a lot to do with addiction, right? It's a small picture of the reason people don't want to believe in God is because the next step, if they do, is, well, he might want something, you know, he might, he might expect something of my life. And, and so with, with EMF, a, a tiny picture of that is, if I look into this and I find that this stuff really is harmful, somebody's going to take away my tech. Nobody's going to take away your tech. But for people who who really are open to learning, go camping. <laughs> go camping in a place with a lot of terrain, uh, in a mountainous area, in a in a deserted valley, in a punch bowl, um, next to a huge rock. You know, some place where you have absolutely no cell phone signal at all, zero, not on any of the carriers, and spend a few nights, see what happens. I think that is more instructive than anything. I mean, I can point you to the bio-initiative report. I could tell you about Alan Frey and what he learned about the dissolving of the blood-brain barrier with amounts of radio frequency radiation less than a cell phone. And we don't test cell phones for dissolving the blood-brain barrier. Should we even imagine anybody has one that's intact, you know? I mean, I could tell you lots of different things um, like that. I could point you to Magda Havas and, and show some of the wonderful work that she's done on, um, you know, diabetics and how their insulin requirements change when they're subjected to dirty electricity and whatnot. There, there are tons of sources of information, but really just cut through all of that. Just go take a week, get to a place that can't have any EMF and no other people. Camp out, put your feet on the ground, put your face to the sun, spend a few days and see what happens. I guess that, that, would, be, that would be my approach for somebody who is an, uh, a, an earnest questioner. Yeah, no, that's a great example. I think we've spoken to, a, I think Dr. Jack Cruz brought up that example of, of going camping, sort of giving yourself a reset, especially for people's sleep. And I pretty much, I think anyone could attest that's gone on significant amount of camping trips, that they sleep better when they're camping. And it's sort of not a surprise to me. And you could chalk it up to a lot of things, but I think electromagnetic frequencies are one of those things when you diminish those. Now it's going to get harder and harder with, you know, signal expansion and, and things like Starlink and stuff like that, they're going to give people access where you couldn't before. Um, but it's still probably better than, you know, being in the middle of Salt Lake city like me. <laughs> but, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is sort of walking through what you do with somebody. Let's say you meet someone who's ready. And like you said, there are different avenues you can take them down. I mean, you have people that want to go a certain distance. Maybe they want to go the full distance, like Tristan over here or yourself or me in an ideal world where other people would be okay with me doing that. Um, but how do you approach somebody's remediation? Could you walk us through sort of like a process when someone comes to you and they say, hey, we want you to look at our house and give us a hand with what we're dealing with. Say it's like in the suburbs or something like that. They, they're aware of the problems that are around them. Um, but what are sort of the heavy hitters? And I want to I want to give away all your business model here, but 
Um, what are sort of top of mind things that you look at with somebody to get them moving in the right direction to make that impact? Are you looking to get the benefits of grounding and earthing, but really just can't be barefoot all the time? Yes, you know what I'm talking about, right? Absorbing free electrons from the earth, improving your circadian rhythm and blood flow and vitality and redox. And that is why I'm excited that this show is brought to you by Rizal Shoes. Rizal Shoes are, in my awareness, the only non-sandal grounded shoes. They have slip-ons and they have cool boots as well with laces that are not only grounded via a copper plug, but have leather outsoles made with water buffalo hide. So they're all natural. They are grounded and they're barefoot and minimalist with a wide toe box. This is imperative for foot health, and it's really going to keep you connected in a modern lifestyle setting so you don't have to walk around barefoot all the time. I love them in the wintertime. I can wear socks with my slip-ons and not be freezing cold trying to be grounding. You need to check them out, folks. Rizal Shoes, R-H-I-Z-A-L dot C-O. Rizal dot co is their website. Use code DRADIO at checkout for 10% off and get your shoes get grounded, get connected, and improve your health. Yeah, I'm not worried about giving away my business model. Too late. <laughs> I put, I put, uh, I try to put everything I know on my podcast because I really want decentralization um, on a profound level with regard to EMF stuff. We need a 1,000, we need 10,000 more people doing what I do just in the U.S. alone. So, yeah, I'll tell you exactly what I do when I, when I go into somebody's home. You know, it begins uh, um, on the drive-in, and I look for um, the utility approach. Like, what do we have? Do we have high-tension lines? Do we have high-voltage lines? Do I see any infrastructure like uh, cell phone towers or things like that? I just notice those on the way in. And then when I get to the client's home, I, I look at it, how are they connected to the grid. Um, not all my clients are connected to the grid, but if they're connected to the grid, I want to know, is that like an underground feeder or is that overhead? And because there's you, you can attenuate the electric fields, which is, well, you can t attenuate the electric fields in an underground um, power situation. But then I've got to wonder where that line is running. So I look for where the transformer is because I want to see if that main service line is running to the main elec the, the electric panel underneath the house, a living area, because those magnetic fields are not really attenuated at all, even in the earth. So notice those things. And then the first thing I do with the client is I like to go in and just sit down at their kitchen table with them and just kind of hang out for a little while. I know a lot of people want to rush in and it's this big, you know, economic bottle, get in, get out, whatever. I like to um, spend my time with people. And I, I just like to I want to understand what their concerns are. So like I said earlier, I only deal with people who get it. And if they get it, they come in one of two flavors. Either they've made that correlation and they realize this stuff is hurting them. It's impacting their, their lives dramatically. Or, um, and there are a lot of these people who want to remain proactive it's really kind of amazing, and it, and it uh, it makes me happy every time I get a call from one. Nobody's symptomatic, and uh, often these people are young couples. You know, they're just starting out, and um, maybe they're thinking about having a child, and they just want to have a good environment for the family to grow. So I want to understand whether somebody's symptomatic. Not that I'm a healthcare provider. I'm not a healthcare provider. Um. Or is it just that they're trying to be proactive? So what is the, and that's kind of that magnitude between, are we going to have a lot of remediation? Or are we just going to, you know, do some things around the edges? And then we will, I'll ask them, what are your questions? And so we'll, we'll spend time talking about what they want to know about EMF. Because everybody has some understanding of it. And I just want to make sure we're more or less in the same ballpark. And then I will make sure that they uh, have at least a rudimentary understanding of the four different types of EMF. And the, the following fact that a dose of radiation, any type of radiation is equal to the intensity of 
the exposure times the duration. So whatever type of radiation you're talking about. And therefore, in a uh, what I call a commodity home, a home that's not built with EMF resilience in mind, there are places you, you don't want to be. Um, your baby's not going to thrive if you put the bassinet in front of the main electric panel. Not a good place. You don't want to nurse the baby there either. You don't want to do it in front of your, you don't want to read a book in front of your induction cook stove. But, you know, these are hopefully not prolonged exposures, although they might be very intense. But where we need to uh, apply our efforts is the places where my clients spend four or more hours per day. And that kind of limits the number of places in the house that we focus on. I think a lot of people have the idea that when you do an EMF assessment and evaluation, you, you check every inch of the house. No, you don't. You can't. And you can't make every inch of a commodity home safe. But you can make the bedroom safe or safer. Um, and you can make the office safe and you can make the living room safe if those are the places that really matter to that particular client. And then, and I should mention, I always work with my wife um, on my assessments. And I didn't always do that in the beginning, but um, I, I like spending time with my wife. She enjoys spending time with me. Um, and we can do twice as much work uh, in half the time. So in, so, say, four hours, we can get almost eight hours worth of work done. So then what we will do is we will go around to the places where uh, folks spend four or more hours a day, and we measure each of the four types of harmful man-made electromagnetic radiation. Tristan, I hope that's a better word than non-native EMF. And when we, we record those, and that's for us and for our records and also for the client, they get to keep that then we go and we turn off the main electric panel so that all of the appliances go off, all the electricity goes off. And we will spend a little bit of time finding the battery powered devices, smartphones and uh, weather, weather stations, things like that. And we just want to get all the sources of the harmful man-made stuff turned off so that we can get a baseline. It won't turn off the neighbor's Wi-Fi. It won't turn off the cell phone tower down the street, your back neighbor's baby monitor. It won't get all that. But it will show you where is the self-generated stuff. And you know what is really interesting is so many people... Like we just did a client last week and they were like in the worst of the worst level of EMF exposure in radio frequency radiation. But when we turned everything off, they were living in a beautiful place with a thousand times less RF radiation. They were making all their own mess. And, and that's a big aha for a lot of people. So once we turn the power off, we go back to those same places that we've already been, and we take the same measurements again. And then um, that takes the bulk of the time. Then I need 20 minutes to a half hour, and I sit down right there. And I just, you know, set the client's expectation. I need, need a few minutes here. Take me about 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And I will put together a custom remediation plan right on the spot so that they will have that before I leave. And the way I do that is by creating that contrast between everything on and everything off, I can know where the illegitimate energies are coming from and then what the most effective ways to reduce personal exposure to those types of radiation. And I always tell my clients, because everybody thinks it's going to cost a lot of money. It sometimes costs nothing and they're, they are reluctant. <laughs> and what I mean by that is you can turn off your cell phone at night 
that's a huge thing. I mean, really, it your cell phone, whether you know it or not, is is spewing forth radiation on a continual basis, every few seconds or every few minutes, having nothing to do with getting a text or a phone call or anything. It's just checking in with the tower. A lot of radiation spilling out of that thing all the time. If you got the Wi-Fi Bluetooth on, constant source of radiation. So you suggest to people, you know, you might like to turn this thing off at night. And some people, well, you'd think you'd think they took away their birthday, you know. And um, and other people, other people are great. They'll look, honey, we could do that. Yeah, that's just a behavior change. Yeah, we're good. So the free things um, that require behavior modification um, are difficult for some people and other people are just all about that. And then, of course, there are things that um, in certain circumstances, and it's different for every client, but there are some things that can be helpful. And I just want to make one final um, comment about remediation, and then I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. And that is that all of the remediation work that I do is measurable remediation. And I just want to make that really clear. I'm not talking about charms and pendants and harmonizers and personal protection devices, things that are ethereal and and subtle energies may or may not exist, just can't be measured. I'm a, I'm a physics kind of guy. Um, So I want to be able to show measurable reductions and, and let's work on those first. So all of the types of remediation and even the things that require a product um, are related to measurable reductions in all four types of harmful man-made radiation. So is that a, is that a good overview? Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned the harmonizers and the pendants because yeah, I'm kind of tired of people sending this stuff to me and it's like, you know, whatever you can believe. Um, if you have the expendable income to try these things, but like you said, there's no proof from a measurement from a physics perspective. And then if you don't, it's like, it's like grounding in a high EMF environment. It's, it's like, if you don't have your ducks in a row and you don't attack it from the foundational level, like you're leaving a lot still on the table and this stuff usually costs like little to no money. It's just habit changes. And that's something that for some reason people still would rather just pay a lot of people, I should say, not everyone would, would rather just pay some amount of money to have the, the quick fix. But I guess that it encapsulates a greater issue with our society. So you, you mentioned a few times now the the four types of EMFs, the, the major types. And I'm curious for you to go through that. Um, I'm assuming, you know, we have low frequency power frequencies, from our electrical grid, we have the radio frequencies, we have the electric magnetic field components of that, we have dirty electricity. How do you think about these different types? Uh, is one more important than the other? Is you know one more challenging to mitigate than the other? You know, we've had a few people on the podcast. I've talked to a lot of EMF mitigation folks. And it seems like everyone has their angle at, at what is, you know, the worst for you. And, and, and for some reason, whoever's like in their own niche, like wants to say that X, you know, low frequency is the worst or dirty electricity is the worst to me. And it doesn't really matter, you know, and again, it's, it's like leaving things on the table. It could be unique to your environment, which one may be the biggest issue. But I'm curious to get your take because you seem to have a very well-rounded, uh, holistic approach to the EMF mitigation and yeah, what, what do you think about the variety in the electromagnetic spectrum in the man-made non-native realm and how to deal with them? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. And one of the things that you could say is that the higher the frequency, you know, the shorter the wavelength, the, the more energetic the photons are. And it's absolutely true. That's a physical phenomenon. So that might argue that radio frequency radiation is the worst and millimeter wave radio frequency radiation is beyond, beyond decency, you know, 
clearly much more um, energetic. However, um, I work with with people who live in the sort of society and people who have been driven completely out of society. They've lost everything. They can no longer work or even exist in a place with even something like cell phone service. I mean, these people are um, a long ways towards, uh, a long way from what we consider to be a normal life. And, I, and I'm really interested in people's stories and what happened and how, how did things get to this way. And what I've learned is that any of these electromagnetic energies have been correlated in stories that people tell me to electrical sensitivity and then, you know, their, their downfall. So I've known people who have had low frequency exposure that has led to tremendous sensitivity and a need to leave society. And I'll talk about what low frequency exposure means in a minute. And then I meet people all the time who are able to say, when that cell phone tower went in across the street or just down the block, from that night on, I didn't sleep. And then I started getting ringing in my ears and, you know, all, you know, malaise, you know, all these different things. So I think it's very often radio frequency radiation, but I think, I think, Every single one of them is bad, every single form. So I'll, I'll go through and I'll talk about the different forms. And you sort of break these four into high frequency and low frequency. And when I say high frequency, I'm talking about radio frequency radiation. Different people make that break. In different places, some people want to say above a thousand hertz is, you know, high frequency, and other people want to say, oh, above uh, twenty-seven billion hertz is radio frequency. So I, I won't quibble about exactly where that dividing is, but it's intentional radiators. That's what we're really talking about. So according to the FCC in the in the United States, for example, you have to have a license for something that's an intentional radiator of radio frequency radiation. So that goes in one category all by itself, and that goes all the way up to the um, crazy millimeter wave stuff. The low frequency stuff is attributes of our power system. So it's having to do with electric and magnetic fields. Why do we have electric and magnetic fields on the low end? That's weird. We only talk about radio frequency radiation on the high end. And the, the answer is coherence. Um, there's a formula for the length of a wave, the wavelength, and when coherence happens. So the electrical energies from the grid are coherent, but only many thousands of miles away. So we're, we're always in the near field there, and the electric and the magnetic potentials need to be considered separately. So when we get to the low frequency and the power line stuff, we think about electric fields, and then we think about magnetic fields. A way to think of, a way to um, consider the difference between the two is if you have power available in your home and absolutely nothing turned on, nothing plugged in, no energy being used at all, your electric fields in that house will be maximum. They don't get any higher. They don't get any lower. That's it. You know, you've got your full electric field potential with the power on and nothing being used. The magnetic field exposure is proportional to how much energy you're actually consuming. So current flow is what we're really talking about. And when you have current flow, then you have the potential for magnetic fields. 
or um, inductive uh, inductive devices like uh, motors and whatnot, those produce a magnetic field as well. So electric fields and magnetic fields. And then the third thing um, that has to do with low frequency is in, in my realm, it's called dirty electricity. I never really liked the term because it sounds, I don't know, it sounds hokey kind of, doesn't it? I mean, oh, it's electricity that's dirty. But it's, um, I don't know, it's a, I guess it's a term of art in EMF assessment and me remediation. I would like to, I like to call it conducted electromagnetic interference. So from a, from a electrical perspective, what dirty electricity is, is everything that should not be on your electric lines. The only thing that really should be on the electric power lines is a 60 cycle sine wave in North America anyway, um, that describes that vacillation that I talked about earlier from a, a peak voltage to actually a zero voltage and then a negative voltage 60 times in one second. And that's all you should really see on, you know, say, uh, a frequency trace of your power lines. That's really not what I see when I take an oscilloscope and I look at somebody's power. I see a lot of different frequencies there have nothing to do with the delivery of power, nothing that you're paying for when you pay your electric bill, nothing that's going to be helpful for you when you're running your refrigerator or your well pump or whatever it may be. These things don't belong there. And so that's why we call it dirty electricity. And uh, there can be, it's a, it's a very much an understudied area, but everything we know about it is, is that it's not good. So those are the four things, electric fields, magnetic fields, dirty electricity, and radio frequency radiation. Yeah, super interesting. I mean, I don't know, I always get... Uh lost in this i think it's easy to get overwhelmed with sort of the, the 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 magnitude of 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 the issues that's why i like how you broke it down and i like the fact that you keep things for people generally simple because fundamentally i think the changes a lot of people need to make to some degree are simple it's like putting that phone away at night and I actually i sort of laughed when you said that earlier because almost everyone i've told that to or told that i do that at night too is like well how is someone supposed to reach you in the middle of the night and i'll be like well they don't if something tragic happens i'll find out at eight in the morning and i'll still be sad then only i'll be well rested <laughs> it's usually what i tell people um so one that i don't know tristan what did you go a little bit deeper there before i ask sort of was something that i was interested in but i'm going to ask him now if he does no you're good ryan you can go Okay, I wanted to ask one thing about just the millimeter wavelengths because Tristan had Rob uh, Rebig on uh, from Oppabar, uh, and they talked about that as well. But we actually did a live not too long ago talking about the rollout of those waves sort of happening more soon than we maybe had anticipated before in high density areas. Maybe we could get into a little bit about just your your view around those and why they are so troubling, maybe in a way that we hadn't dealt with before because it's sort of like an it's a ne every every new thing is the next level but this is like a next level and so our, i love you to kind of dive to that and maybe break that down a little bit for our audience that maybe be less familiar are you self-employed or a small business owner and are tired of paying hundreds of dollars a month to centralized health insurance companies for minimal coverage because there is no alternative well i have good news for you there is and this podcast is brought to you by crowd health CrowdHealth is a more decentralized alternative to health insurance, and it uses community and crowdfunding to help its members pay for emergencies when they do happen. They incentivize and prioritize health and personal responsibility and share the thought that you should really only be using the centralized healthcare system when emergencies do happen. This is what I am on board with, and I have personally signed up for CrowdHealth since I left the corporate engineering world and the medical benefits that come with it. If you want to learn more, 
you can check out our episode with CEO and founder Andy Schoonover, or you can head over to joincrowdhealth.com and use code DRADIO, D-R-A-D-I-O, when you sign up to get a discounted rate of only $99 for the first three months. Centralized healthcare is one of the biggest issues in our society today, and I really love what Crowd Health is doing to provide an alternative for people who care. Yeah, yeah, you bet. I'm happy to. And by the way, Ryan, I, I really agree with what you're saying about how, how can I get in touch with you at night? Um, I've seen in my life fax machines, voicemail, cell phones, um, email, all get added to the expectations that we're supposed to live under the under the burden of. And are we getting that much more money? Is life that much richer? So yeah, I'm with you. Just turn it off. But yeah, with regard to the the millimeter wave stuff, it is just absolutely um, crazy what's going on there now. And I just started a, a three part, might be a four part series on my Substack that that deals with you know what exactly is 5G because a lot of this millimeter stuff is is conflated with with 5G and um the the really unfortunate thing is i think we were all led to believe that 5G high band so to speak was being conflated with millimeter wave radiation so this is going to be like the first time in history humans are going to be exposed to millimeter wave radiation as with this terrible specter that we're meant to be afraid of 5g that's getting rolled out and what i what i found i was asked to be a beta tester for um the first really helpful millimeter wave product with the the correct level of uh, accuracy sensitivity and third party uh, certification that so I could use in my work. So it was my first view into millimeter wave radiation in the environment. I was super excited because, you know, you have to have a particular piece of equipment to be able to see a particular phenomenon. And I had heard a lot about millimeter wave tech, and I, I didn't have any way of seeing if it was there. And my most sensitive clients, we live in a very uh, rural, remote area, um, in the inland northwest, about 50 miles from the Canadian border. So it's pretty peaceful up here, and I figured we were going to be spared the uh, the horrors of millimeter wave 5G implementation, and we have been. But I found there was already environmental exposure of 5G, excuse me, millimeter wave radiation. And if you buy food or you travel... Not only are you being exposed right now, but you've been exposed for a long time. How long? I don't know. Long enough for every grocery store in the area we live, and we have a national chain, a couple of regional chains, and a local chain. To walk into any of those grocery stores, you're going to be um, exposed to really intense millimeter wave radiation. And Tristan... We know there's a lot of different ways to open the door for people. You don't need to use millimeter wave radiation to open a door to get into a supermarket. There's a lot of different ways to solve that problem. So why all the grocery stores um, now bathe their customers in millimeter wave radiation when they go in to shop? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, one woman shared with me that her child can't go into a supermarket because he goes into seizures. And I wonder if that's why. I sometimes feel slightly disoriented when I walk in the door. I wonder if that's why. So, you know, who said that was okay? And why did anybody make that decision? Should we not be careful with radiation exposures of all types and, and be cautious, especially where women and children are, are possibly being exposed? So that, that would, it, unfortunately, what I'm saying is even in this uh, rather peaceful area where I live, if you want to buy groceries, you're going to get exposed. Now we have one grocery store out of four that has a delicatessen door. You know, you push it open. And that one, you can go in with no millimeter wave radiation exposure. So that's, 
um, something I've tried tried to let my local um, followers know about. The other thing is we have other millimeter wave exposures that have been increasing. They've been in place since at least 2009, and it has to do with vehicular radar. So millimeter wave radiation emitters, intentional emitters, intentional radiators on vehicles for the purpose of things like adaptive cruise control, collision avoidance, backup, you know, these different things. And I wonder whether it's worth it. I wonder whether it's worth it to have everybody in the population now exposed to millimeter wave radiation. And let's just assume the health effects are unknown. Um, well, wh where's our control group going to be if we ever want to, you know, make sense out of what's going on with a, a new disease in the future or whatever. So sadly, what I learned is even in, in beautiful places, you can't avoid millimeter wave radiation exposure that has absolutely nothing to do with 5G cell service, 5G telephony. So these two are not to be conflated, millimeter wave radiation and 5G. It's, it's broader than that. So then we can talk about the um, 5G cell service and the millimeter wave aspect of that. And what I see as the greatest danger there might surprise you, but we'll kind of go through this a little bit at a time. I mentioned earlier that the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, the greater the energetic potential of the photons. That's well accepted. So when you get into the millimeter wave radiation, much, much more energetic. And therefore, a need for to push harder and the distance that these things can travel and retain that energy is shorter. Still governed by the inverse square law, but all of this boils down to meaning you have to have a multitude of, of, of uh, transmitters and antennas to serve. And by the way, I say serve with air quotes because in the 21st century, serve and service means exposure to a sea of unnatural radiation. Cell phone service, Wi-Fi service, 5G service. It means you are in a sea of unnatural radiation. No sea of unnatural radiation, no service. So... What a weird turn of language, right? Yeah, I want service. Anyway, so you um, want to have 5G cell service, millimeter wave, you know, the fastest variety possible. It's going to involve a huge number, a, a dramatic increase in the number of transmitters and antennas in a particular area. So the danger that I see, other than it, it, it's totally unt untested, we know all forms of non-native, all forms of harmful man-made electromagnetic radiation up to this point have been harmful. We don't know how much more harmful millimeter wave is going to be. It's untested. They introduced it before any of the testing. So now we're going to make a huge number of transmitters in certain areas, you know, metropolitan areas, sporting stadiums, things like that. And then I mentioned my concern might be a little bit different than you would think. It is because there is no safe level of exposure. Uh, I think Neil Cherry and, and others were among the first to, to state that and, and prove it. The only known level of exposure, safe level of exposure, is actually zero. And I don't mean zero on a cheap meter. I mean zero out to, you know, 16 decimals. Um, and Arthur Furstenberg has just written a, a beautiful paper demonstrating, among other things, sometimes there's an inverse relationship between power intensity and physiological effect. That's a mind blower, right? 
So there are experiments that have been conducted at a certain power uh, power density level, and then they repeated it with a power density 1,000 times lower and found a greater physiological effect. So let that let that soak in. Sometimes a smaller exposure can cause a more dra dramatic physiological effect. That's my concern in an area with an abundance of transmitters and antennas is at any point in time, you're being exposed to the gamut. I mean, every possible power level in the millimeter radiation spectrum from the highest level with the, you know, your nearest transmitter to the one 14 blocks away that you can't measure, you know, it's below zero on even the best meter you have, but the inverse square law does not go to zero, you know, no, no, these energies are infinite. So that's, that's the, that's my take on what, what, one of the things that's going to be really harmful about the 5G cell service uh, millimeter wave. Yeah, I mean, you outlined a lot of great points and that, yeah, people don't even, aren't even aware that, you know, radar guns are using like 30 gigahertz or 33 gigahertz traffic cameras. I mean, the new L3 Harris airport scanners are using millimeter waves. The grocery store one's funny as well because you don't even think about it. I guess the good thing is that, you know, to me is like you can worry about all these things, but at the end of the day, your cell phone is still, you know, maybe you go to the grocery store every day. Um, that's once a day. But how many hours are you spending on your phone? And to me, uh, as practical advice is, the relationship and how you use your phone is, is definitely going to be probably the number one source. And, you know, there's some people out there that don't even have a cell phone or, or are completely hardwired because of that. And it's, it's such a challenge in the modern world, which is really the modern toxic soup that, that you're mentioning, right? Like we're just in this sea of noise and that signal to noise ratio has never been lower. And yeah, you mentioned the lower intensity having this small, this increased uh, physiological effect. It, we just really have no idea. I mean, you could ask what's worse, RF or, or low frequencies. You know, you could go in depth. And, and because we've been so ignorant and because we haven't been able to fund like, you know, the proper studies, we really don't know. There's plenty of evidence to conclude that man-made EMFs are, are harmful but we don't really have the luxury of doing these, you know, controlled tests about, you know, what frequencies are worse, what intensities are worse. Is this affecting one organ system versus the other? Because we haven't yet admitted as a society that they are harmful. And to me, that's that's the worst part, because ignorance is then allowing this giant science experiment to, to proliferate. And yeah, the the millimeter wave rollout. Um, to me in big cities and airports and downtown areas is, is a major concern, but it really comes back as well to the cell phones and then the density of people. So the more people, the more devices, the more beams and the more EMFs that you're, you're in the crossfire constantly. So that C is, is much more, uh, you know, it's much deeper. It's, it's much more active. And I think people should just be aware of that because it is a big ask to say like, yeah, move away from a downtown area perhaps, but even, even living in the suburbs, I think is a, is a massive step in the right direction. And then just like you said, creating that somewhat of a sleep sanctuary for yourself, like turn it off at nighttime. Like, do you, do you really need this? Give your body a break for once because we don't know what, intensity and what level is affecting our biology but we do know that if you get a good night's rest if you actually you know eliminate the source and really lower that exposure by unplugging your wi-fi turning your phone off you know having no un or plugged in appliances in your bedroom you'll be better able to restore and repair 
at night. And I just always come back to that because we could go back and forth, Keith, for probably another two hours and people would would probably get more confused or about what they should do because there is so much nuance. We have still so much to learn, but I think having a precautionary but not neurotic mindset about what's realistic for you and what's low hanging fruit to reduce your exposures is probably the best way. Um, and the only caveat I'll say as well as 5G is like good thing that higher frequencies have have much worse range um, and are, are much more, you know, uh, deflected or, or dissipated um, by distance and structures, because it's just another reason why perhaps getting out of the city might be might be a good a good thing if, if you're trying to raise a family or, or healing from a chronic health condition. Yeah, I, I really, uh, I really agree with what you're saying. You know, we've talked about, we've talked about the fundamental di- mismatch between legitimate EMF and man-made EMF, and th- the fact that the man-made EMF is is not present and probably universally harmful to our biology. But there's hope in all these things. I think everything I've mentioned there are things that you can do. You got to go shopping. Great. Don't loiter in front of the store. Mm -hmm. don't loiter between the two sets of doors if you're a health conscious food consumer who's also very active you know how big of a struggle it is to find a bar that is both convenient and nutrient dense that's why i was so excited when i discovered the alpa bar the alpa bar is a meat-based bar that contains only simple ingredients 100 grass-fed beef tallow and honey and is both nutrient dense and convenient and packs a caloric punch of over 300 calories. For me, this was a game changer and is now the go-to snack and fuel source I use when I'm hiking, camping, hunting, skiing, or doing anything in the outdoors and I don't have the resources to cook a full meal. The Alpa Bar is made proudly in Colorado and only uses locally sourced meat. JJ and Rob are also extremely based and accept Bitcoin for payment. I highly recommend you check out the Alpa Bar for any time you need a nutrient-dense and convenient snack on the go. Check them out at eatalpa.com and use code DRADIO5 at checkout to get a 5% discount. And if you pay in Bitcoin, you can get an additional discount on top of that. That's eataupa.com and use code DRADIO5 at checkout. With purpose and safety, move through as quickly as you can. And don't stop until you're 20 feet past the door. That's it. That's all you got to do. Um, don't don't check out at the door that's next to the. Uh, don't check out at the checkout stand that's next to that that door. You know you, you can minimize personal exposure. You don't need any equipment for that. You just need, you know. And and then on the on the on the highway, don't sit between. T- two cars if you're in a rural area if you, if you don't have to because if they're newer cars they b- probably both are emitting this vehicular radar and and on and on there, there's there's always things that can be done and to get back to what you were saying absolutely it is a cell phone that is um going to be your greatest source of radiation i took a a recording meter and i put it next to a cell phone i live out in the middle of the woods here so there was really no other RF to speak of. And then I just looked at the recording and I, I did a, a YouTube video on that. And you could see this cell phone's not doing anything. I mean, there's no text, there's no anything going on, but it's just pulsing and pulsing, you know, every once in a while. So if you can um, pattern your life in such a way that you can turn that off, maybe get a landline phone in your house, that'll reduce your radiation exposure tremendously. If you decide you can't do that, it doesn't mean there's nothing you can do. Go put your phone in the next room. Just distance can can play a a massive role. Yeah, okay, it'll be a little less convenient for you to get up and, and go into the next room and get it. But um, that will make a, a reduction in your radiation exposure. Maybe if you and your wife are together, maybe you turn one of your cell phones off, that'll make a difference. In every instance, um, there's there's some things that can be done, and they're simple. Wi-Fi, you decide you want Wi-Fi in your house. Okay, fine. Um, do you need it at night? You know, there's a, a $15 
remote cutoff switch that's available. Plug your Wi-Fi router into this thing. You get a little fog. Oh, here's what it looks like. You get one of these um, next to your bed. Uh, I don't use Wi-Fi. I'm using this, using this for something else. But anyway, when you're ready for bed, the last person in just presses this button and and whatever you got hooked up to this uh, turns off. So there are many, many things that can do and nobody needs to feel like there's nothing that I can do to reduce my personal exposure. There really is. There's quite a bit. Yeah, it's huge. Everything you just said, I, I couldn't agree with more. And actually, I've found the further you get down this road, whether it's looking at EMFs or just anything in health, really, sort of simplicity is the name of the game. I mean, nature's made it very obvious what we need and what we don't need. And it's funny because I'll get uh, comments from from friends all the time that what helps them the most is what they take away, not necessarily what they add. And that could not be more true. And so, yeah, I mean, it's addiction to convenience for a lot of these things at the end of the day. It's really it's really interesting to sort of watch people's uh, reactions to to things that I do or, or say that I have clients do or, or, or whatever. But like you said, yeah, it's like focus on the people that are curious, uh, willing to listen. Sort of one question I wanted to have uh, before I hand it back to Tristan is... Um, I know Tristan wants to build a home. I'd love to build a home. When you're building a home, how would you approach that? I mean, maybe you build the home you're in because I'm, I'm sort of assuming. But uh, how how have you looked at, at that? Because that's, in my mind, a huge opportunity for yourself to set up success. Yeah. Um, I love doing the home, home design and, and building projects. It is where everything comes together it is is such a fun activity and um i've had the opportunity to to do what you might call mansions and then uh just completed my my first tiny house and yeah i i um designed and actually my wife and son and i actually built this house that we're in now and it depends on exactly what the client wants to achieve you can have what I call durable protection against the harmful man-made stuff um, that really doesn't cost that much more in your uh, in your home construction, and it's going to give protection forever. So a really simple example is that when you're running your wiring, instead of using the plastic, uh, what do you call it, Romex or whatever, use the type of wiring that has a little spiral metal coating on it. It's called MC, uh, metallic cable. Okay, it costs more than the plastic stuff, but in the overall scheme of a house, are you kidding me? I mean, it's a, it's a rounding error on your cabinet, you know, decision for your, for your kitchen. And Forever, then, the house is not going to be emitting electric fields like it was. And if you did nothing else um, other than designing your home to reduce the electric fields, oh, man, there would be a sense of peace. People go into your home and say, it feels so good here, <laughs> you know. So, um, and you there there's cautions you if you implement your wiring system wrong you're going to get something we haven't talked about called nuisance current and it's going to be traveling all over that that mc cable in your walls and um that would be troubling so you have to implement this stuff carefully but i'm just giving you an idea of how you know one of the very simple things that you can do um, you can do other very simple things like just look at your floor plan and look at your largest magnetic fields. What are my largest magnetic fields? Your largest magnetic fields are going to be an induction stove, an electric stove, a refrigerator, uh, any kind of a pump that you that you might have. And don't put them on the other side of your bedroom wall where you're going to sleep. You know, five feet away is, is going to be fine, but maybe don't put those 
those things right on the other side of where baby is sleeping or whatever. So it's just laying out the house differently than you might have. And um, there, there are many examples like that. Of course, the, the ultimate is doing radio frequency shielding, RF shielding on the home. And that's where you get the opportunity to cut out your neighbor's Wi-Fi and your back neighbor's baby monitor and, you know, all of that type of radiation, the cell phone tower down the street. And I want to say something that's very important, which is there is no perfect shielding, okay? No matter how good your shielding is and how thick it is and how uh, big or small your, your radiation source that you're trying to shield, some of it will bounce off the shielding, some of it will get stuck inside, and some of it, it might be immeasurable, depending on the quality of the shielding, as some amount is going gonna, is gonna to make it through. So I don't want to give anybody the false impression that you're going to have 0. you know, 0, 0, 16 zeros, but you can get um, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.000 uh, microwatts per square meter of, of RF. And that all comes down to managing, you know, your shielding strategy. Um, by the way, don't ever let anybody paint your bedroom black uh, if we have time to talk about that later. But your shielding strategy when you're building a home, um, getting that right, and then managing your penetrations. So every window, every door, if you have a chimney, you know, your your plumbing vents, all of those are penetrations in what is otherwise than a Faraday cage. So you have to manage all of those things very carefully. And then for that reason, you will have incredible attenuation from the outside environment. It won't be perfect, which all of that argues find a very good place and then build a shielded home would be the smart money. I think those are great recommendations. And the thing about this often, definitely the shielded cabling conduit, like low hanging fruit folks. And it's just wild that if we just acknowledge this, we could reduce such a, um, you know, vast amount of, especially the power frequencies and just use devices smarter. And then I think of the next level is like, if we started from scratch today, Keith, what would our, you know, what would be the most optimal electrical system? And I, I think it would look like something, we have the AC transmission because that's massive infrastructure overhaul, but maybe communities start popping up where the AC to DC conversion, instead of happening at the adapter level in your charging cables, is happening at the pole outside your house and your house is fully run on on dc and we can make dc appliances they have them for what like campers and, and things like that and you still shield all the all the cables but then you have a much you know lower effect from having a static field so i'm curious on your take there what would you do if, if you were starting the electrical grid from scratch if, if you were like in charge of the technological revolution would you just make everybody you know go fiber optic and and maybe we can yeah round out here on just some fun brainstorming on if we were in charge of everything and had unlimited money what would a system look like that's really at level one considering the end user's health the end societal members health well <clears throat> i can tell you what i wouldn't do for the rollout of the grid um, we have a fatal flaw in, in the grid, and that is that more than half of the current is returned through the earth. It's just, it's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely mind boggling. We want to have lightning protection um, for the grid infrastructure and obviously for homes, but bonding the common conductor and the ground in the way that it's done in the majority of, of North America means that you have electric power current flowing back to the point of distribution, like a substation or the point of generation. And it's absolute madness. Um, I wish I had the ability to share a screen real quickly, but I don't have it set up. 
I uh, I went to this pristine place. We're talking a bubbling stream, a rich, you know, lush valley filled with grasses and different plants and whatnot. And I thought, oh man, this is this is paradise. So I'm going to take some pictures here. You know, I enjoy doing that, and I'm taking some pictures, and I'm thinking, what am I doing? I should take my feet off and I take my shoes off in ground. And I, um, I said, you know what? I want to check out the EMF before I do that. And bear in mind, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. There's no power lines. There's no people. But I'm a nerd, so, so I had to do it, right? So I check out, and there's uh, unfortunately a sea of unnatural radiation because there's cell phone service relatively low, I suppose, five microwatts per square meter, but disappointing that there was any. And then I... I almost didn't check out the electric and magnetic fields because I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. There's not going to be any. But I always check because I can be humbled if I make a guess. So I get out the meter. Of course, there's no electric fields. There's nothing visible above ground. Massive magnetic fields. I mean, I'm talking about levels that, according to the research, would increase um, miscarriage and possibly lead to childhood leukemia and things like and I'm like, what in the world is going on? Well, I thought about it later. And so this stream bed, um, and then you have a, an electrical generating facility at the, at the uh, other side of this valley. And I think just because of the difference in the conductivity in that little valley with the stream bed and the water flowing through it, that phenomenon that I told you about where we are at, we made the decision to return current to the point of distribution or generation through the earth, it will explore each and every path, but it will favor the path of least resistance. So it leads to phenomenon like that, where in unexpected places, you can find um, really elevated magnetic fields, which is just a, a super, super uh, bad thing. So you ask, you know, what would be the the perfect? I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow return current to be done through the earth. I think that's a bad thing. I wouldn't allow any conductors above ground. That's just such an easy thing. Then you don't have any electric fields from high tension lines and whatnot. Yes, it would cost a little bit more money, but I, I, so I wouldn't allow um, any any uh, overhead wires. So maybe I'll start with that. And then with regard to the DC, unfortunately, see, I lived off grid for 10 years. And I'll tell you what, off grid is not a panacea. Off grid power can be some of the worst, some of the dirtiest power out there. And um, I was just unable to, to endure the uh, inverter based power just absolutely 100% toxic. And so there are ways that you can can deal with that and can mitigate it, but even just turning the well pump on because you're out in the middle of nowhere and so you're obviously not on city water or anything. But um, even having AC running off off that inverter to, to, to pump the water two or three times a day was just just agonizing. So then I said, well, I'm going to go to DC and I, and I was able to turn everything DC, DC pump, DC, everything, DC refrigerator, DC, um, freezer, agonizing and much more difficult to shield. And so remember we talked before about this orientation in nature of, you know, this, this vertically oriented electric field. If you think about it, the wiring in your house, some of it goes this way. Some of it goes this way. Some of it goes this way. And and I think that and then also the nature of the voltage converters. Because in an off-grid environment, you have things that are wanting to run on 12 volts. Some want to run on 24. Some want to run on 48. And so these voltage converters are built in, which cause the same kind of dirty electricity phenomenon that you have with alternating current. So DC is not a panacea. The nearest fix that I can think of would be um, instead of having nonlinear power supplies, just 
outlaw nonlinear power supplies and go with linear power supplies in the homes. They would make nice little heaters as well. So those those are some of um, some of my thoughts. And was there one other part of that question? I can't remember. No, I think you answered it pretty well. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's tough. There's there's only trade offs, right? But I still think that we can have informed decisions. I used to work in the world of DC DC power conversion. I can tell you for sure it's not in the it's not a hundred percent clean electricity either. Um, but we can think about that, and then you know engineers are they're trying to clean up emissions too, like depending on the end application and yeah, a uh, linear power conversion is, is far better, but there, but there's some limitations. Um, so if we just prioritize that, you know, we could probably solve a lot of that. Um, it's really just acknowledging it. And then, you know, if you get enough smart people working on it, we can find out solutions. But I think what you highlighted there that summary is, is brilliant. And that's why, you know, people like you exist. So if people do want to reach out, Keith, and get your mitigation advice for building a home, for their current home, um, where can people find you? Because I feel like, you know, it's such a valuable knowledge set that you have. And then you also have like this hands-on experience of, of being able to find it. And folks, we can give you all of the advice, the general tips, distance, inverse square law, duration, sleep sanctuary. But every home, every location is a different situation. And that's why it's so important to have someone like Keith come out in person. And if he's not in your location, I know he has a network of, of people he recommends as well. So Keith, where can uh, yeah, where can they find you if they want to get in touch? Uh, thanks, Tristan. I appreciate it. The, um, the website is EMF remedy.com and i also have a weekly podcast that i produce and it is called the emf remedy podcast and it's available on apple google spotify you know all the usual places and um, i'm on youtube at emf remedy and then I um, just have started within the last couple of months on Substack. There's some writing I would really like to do. So on Substack, it's uh, Keith Cutter. So those are the those are the best ways to uh, to get in touch with me. Love to help you, Keith. Thanks so much for coming on. This has been a blast. Um, yeah, we'll we'll have to stay in touch and keep the discourse going on EMF mitigation. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on and thanks everyone for tuning in.